So my name is Tim Sandal and I'm a committee member of Farmig. This um, presentation is about the revised USP chapter which relates to the environmental monitoring of clean rooms for environments in which sterile products are filled. The webinar is designed to last for around um, one hour. And if there is time for any questions at the end, we will take those. Or alternatively, uh, we will ask people to email in their questions or discuss them on the Farmig LinkedIn forum. So a substantially revised uh, chapter for USP 1116 was published um, in May 2012 with the 35th edition of the United States Pharmacopeia. In reviewing this chapter, I will attempt to link some of the findings in the USP to other GMP guidelines. One thing I'm keen to emphasize is how the USP chapter relates to EU GMP. And there are some differences, and in this sense, a degree of caution is required. So part of the emphasis of this talk is to look at the USP in the context of um, the European perspective. Now, there are different sources um, of guidance for environmental monitoring. Those that we can draw upon uh, include regulatory air aspects. So there is EU GMP, particularly Annex 1, which was last revised in 2009. Then there is the FDA Aseptic Filling Guide, which was revised last in 2004. In terms of uh, pharmacopoeia, there's USP 1116, for which a draft was issued in 2011 and the final edition was published in 2012, and that's the main topic of today. There are also uh, standards, of which the uh, most well-known is probably ISO 14698, which was last updated in 1999. Then there are some industry best practice guidelines, most notably PDA Technical Report 13, last revised in 2001, and then there is Farming's own current review of environmental monitoring, which was issued in 2010. And there are also some uh, prominent authors who are listed on this slide. However, despite all that advice, it remains that the environmental monitoring program is an area which the site microbiologist must uh, develop. And there are a lot of key questions which need to be grappled with and eventually put into some form of policy or rationale. And this includes such areas as which type of media to use, how long to incubate for, how frequently to monitor, sampling methods, when to take the samples, sample locations, and things such as data analysis. So this presentation we'll have a look at some environmental monitoring guidance, particularly how the USP chapter should be seen in context, a little bit about the background to the USP 1116 chapter, how and why did it change, to touch on some of the main changes and potential debates, such as areas of method limitations, the move towards assessing environments through incident rates, questions about frequencies of monitoring, locations of monitoring. We'll also have a look at some of the other, perhaps minor, but in some sense of important changes. Let's have a look at the regulatory implications arising from the changes. And also to attempt to link how perhaps some of the changes in the USP help with the advancement of rapid and alternative microbiological methods. So of the various sources of environmental guidance out there, there is only one that is currently under revision that um, we're aware of. 
um, and that is the um, ISO 14698 standard, which is looking at uh, biocontamination control. Now, this standard um, is uh, not that widely used, um, unlike its sister standard, uh, ISO 14644. Uh, and this is probably because the ISO 14698 standard um, is not um, referred to in any regulatory guidance. So ISO 14698 is currently under revision, uh, subject to a review by an international committee. And one of the objectives of the revising that standard is to possibly make it more similar to the non-viable particle monitoring standard, ISO 14644, and that is to come up with perhaps something to work as a viable classification standard for clean rooms, including an assessment of the condition of the areas at startup. And at present, a lot of the drivers for that change are coming from Europe. Now, personally, I'm not sure that the idea of using a grid approach to classify areas at rest is a good idea. And here, I think, when we come on to look at the USP 1116 chapter, uh, the USP's adoption of risk analysis is a far better approach because it's actually orientating the environmental monitoring towards the points of greatest need. But whatever happens with ISO 14698, it will be important that it is embraced by regulatory agencies for it to be of any use. Um, so moving on to the uh, USP revision, um, the process began uh, back in 2005 with the USP uh, Microbiology Committee. The objectives of the committee, uh, my understanding, were to focus the chapter on environment monitoring only, so removing any information relating to process validation, to focus the document exclusively on the monitoring of aseptic environments, so rather than look at all types of clean rooms and controlled environments, such as the non-sterile manufacturing, to bring the focus down into aseptic processing and most importantly, to reconsider the alert and action level or limit concept. So after a long process, the final version of the chapter appeared on the 1st of May 2012. So in considering the main changes, perhaps the most striking change is the change of title. So you can see here that the emphasis is upon aseptic rather than general clean rooms used for any healthcare product. So this creates a clear and intentional sterile and non-sterile distinction. So the retitled USP chapter is microbiological control and monitoring of aseptic processing environments. And leading on from that, the scope of the chapter has now been narrowed to look at the following areas. So we have pharmaceutical sterile products, bulk sterile drug substances, sterile intermediates, and excipients. So although the chapter is not applicable to non-steriles, those of you who are not working in aseptic manufacturing environments there will be elements within the revision that will be of interest and there may be aspects still to take away and have a look at your own environmental monitoring regimes. Um, the chapter is also concerned with certain types of environments and here it classifies them as the conventional clean room with the mobile unidirectional airflow device to blow fill seal machines, to RAB systems, and RABS is an acronym for Restricted Access Barrier Systems, and then to isolators. The 
Another important point to make is that uh, having said that the chapter is focused on sterile processing, it doesn't include all sterile products, but only those products that are filled aseptically. So terminally sterilized products fall outside the scope of the chapter. However, again, there are aspects of clean room design and operation within this chapter that those involved with the manufacture of products that are terminally sterilized will find of interest. In looking at aseptic filling, it's also important to note, and this is a, a useful thing to bear in mind when having uh, regulatory inspections, is that the chapter is not unrealistic in the requirements in relation to levels of biocontamination. The chapter indicates that a low level of contamination over a given period of time is considered to be in some senses expected and possibly even normal. And this is because the presence of people and due to the limitations of the current clean room and isolation technology will occasionally result in the detection of microorganisms. So to select a quotation from the USP chapter, it states that, an, uh, and I quote, an expectation of zero contamination at all locations during every aseptic processing operation is technically not possible and thus unrealistic." And to end quote. So as this quotation illustrates, um, going for zero contamination in aseptic filling is possibly an impossible uh, goal to aim for. Next, an interesting point to note is that with this revised chapter, that all of the old USP clean room descriptions have gone. So whereas previous versions of the USP referred to a metric clean room notational system, so you would see things listed such as M3.5, that is no longer there. Also, um, any references to the previous class 100 class 10,000, etc., which were assessments of clean room particulates as measured in cubic feet, no longer appear in the guidance document. So very much like the FDA 2004 guideline, the USP chapter now only refers to clean rooms by their ISO 14644 class. So here you'll see in the chapter it refers to ISO class 5, ISO class 7, and ISO class 8. So here we do have a difference with both European Union GMP and World Health Organization GMP on one side, and the USP and the FDA guide on the other side. And this is because the World Health Organization and EU GMP use an alphabetic notation. So here clean rooms are listed as grade A, grade B, grade C, and grade D. So there is a, an extent, a translation issue. Now confusingly, uh, both WHO and EU GMP refer to ISO 14644 for classification of clean rooms, but stick to the alphabetical listing for assessing clean rooms in operation. It's also important to note that the ISO class 5, which is reserved for the aseptic core in FDA and USP, is not quite equivalent to EU GMP grade A. And this is due to the difference of the 5 micron particles which are required by EU GMP. Here, EU GMP has a limit of no more than 20 particles of 5 micron size in the measured cubic meter of air, whereas the ISO standard allows a limit of 29. So to uh, cut to the uh, chase, this means that EU GMP grade A is technically equal to ISO class 4.8 
in operation. It's also important to note that uh, unlike EU GMP, the USP chapter does not differentiate between particle count levels at rest and in operation. So with the USP, we can take it that at all times it's referring to clean rooms in operation. So I think it's just important to emphasize those uh, transatlantic differences. Um, the USP has some very useful information referring to the differences between clean rooms, RABs and isolators. And here it offers some very useful advice at looking at the relative risks and says that we should expect different levels of microbial contamination from different types of aseptic barrier systems. So the more intact or stronger the barrier, then the lower level of contamination risk there should be. And this is based on the degree of, of personnel interaction, based on the premise that people are the biggest risk to clean rooms. So the less that a person can interact with the aseptic core, the better this is and the less chance of contamination occurring. And we'll see later uh, that these expectations are based on technological limitations rather than product risk itself. So in continuing to look at the main changes, as I've said, the chapter refers to the International Clean Room Standard ISO 14644 quite a lot. So for the design, building, classification, verification and operation of clean rooms, uh, ISO 14644 is to be followed, particularly in relation to airborne particle cleanliness. And just to, as a reminder, hopefully not over-egging it, but um, EU GMP only uses ISO 14644 for classification, but not for operation. The uh, USP chapter also discusses uh, some aspects of the physical operation of clean rooms, and it discusses clean room air changes. And I think it does so because in ISO 14644, these are only offered in terms of guidance. The USP recommends for a modern clean room that at ISO class 8, there should be 20 air changes per hour. At ISO class 7, there should be 50 air changes per hour. And at ISO class 5, there should be around 100 air changes per hour. Now, those familiar with EU GMP will know that um, the current version of Annex 1 uh, only uses the, ref the term appropriate air changes. Previous editions of EU GMP used to state a minimum of 20, but that is no longer the case. So again, we have a slight difference, USP coming down in terms of stronger recommendations for air changes. Uh, the USP chapter also notes air velocity, so it says that for localized uh, unidirectional airflow protection for maintaining ISO class 5, there should be an airflow of 0.45 meters per second plus or minus 20%. And here we have a match with EU GMP and with the FDA aseptic filling guide. Uh, that's for the conventional uh, unidirectional airflow device within the clean room. For isolators, the USP states that this needs to be user-defined. The USP chapter also discusses airflow visualization, or the smoke study, and says that these are required at ISO class 5. And the chapter very usefully says that an environmental monitoring program should only be devised once airflow mapping in the operational state has been completed and then from that, any uh, HEPA filter or HVAC system issues have been sorted out. And this is because really the, the results of the airflow visualization should be making, uh, helping with the decision as to where the environmental monitoring locations are placed. And the only way to, to really 
get a good feel within the aseptic core of where the best place to put a settle plate or an air sampler is through a smoke study visualization. So moving on to environmental monitoring um, itself as a core subject. Uh, the chapter describes both particle and viable monitoring. So with particles, the USP states that it expects particle control, but it does acknowledge that there will sometimes be occasional fluctuations of particle counts within, within uh, unidirectional airflow devices within clean rooms. Uh, it does say that there's a greater concern when particles start to be detected outside limits and there is a very real concern when this is happening within isolators. In terms of uh, viable uh, monitoring, there is a lot of discussion about the relative inaccuracies of the methods and I'll say something about that shortly. But it's uh, useful to know that the USP considers that all environmental monitoring methods to be semi-quantitative. Uh, and this contrasts a bit with some other guidances which might infer that, say, something like a, an active air sampler is a uh, straightforward quantitative measuring device. The USP adds greater caution that even here, due to uh, particle loss and so on, that it really is a semi-quantitative test. And so this reason about perhaps the semi-quantitative aspect of the methods places a greater emphasis within the chapter upon trending. And in the context of this, uh, the chapter reiterates that isolated counts will occur with aseptic filling, and aseptic filling is not sterile filling. And these isolated counts, it does use the term um, false positives, by which it means counts largely arising from personnel intervention. Now, personally, I'm not sure that the term false positives is the... Um, is the best one, because although, yes, it is something that may have come from the person, uh, a person intervening rather than from a HVAC system breakdown, this shouldn't negate the importance of that and the potential risk of microbial contamination occurring should, for example, that have occurred within the vicinity of a product sample or open vial or something similar. Uh, with environmental monitoring methodology, the USP follows standard practice in terms of the methods listed. So it talks about uh, the monitoring of surfaces with swabs and contact plates or, or, or the RODEC plate, the monitoring of air through active air samples and settle plates, the monitoring of people through finger dabs and gown plates. So fairly standard historically long-serving environmental monitoring methods. For contamination investigations, the USP does give some useful advice. It suggests that where uh, levels of contamination occur, that um, one should have a look at the maintenance of HVAC systems and equipment, or perhaps review disinfectant practices, to have a look at unusual events and activities to consider physical changes to air handling systems and to environmental control, such as temperature and humidity. And the uh, one that's often thrown up regularly, rightly or wrongly, in many out-of-limits investigation, to go and have a look at staff training. The USP chapter um, also then considers um, culture media and the incubation regime. So with culture media, it discusses uh, soya bean casein digest medium, or what everyone commercially knows that known as uh, TSA, tryptone soya agar. With incubation, it talks about the need to have a low and a high temperature, and it discusses a range of 20 to 35 degrees centigrade for not less than 72 hours. However, usefully the chapter does state that um, a fungal medium, such as 
suburb dextrose agar may be used if the recovered environmental flora suggests that such an agar medium is required. And obviously at the moment, um, particularly with uh, FDA, the presence of fungi in uh, clean rooms and controlled environments is, is a hot topic. Whether uh, an, an organization should go with one or two culture media is one of the big recurrent debates within pharmaceutical microbiology, and much depends upon the facility, microflora, and in relation to validation studies. The USP also addresses the subject of anaerobic or microaerophilic microorganisms, and it states that in certain circumstances, such as where a process is using nitrogen gas lines, or perhaps following a sterility test failure where the fluid bioglycolate medium has detected contamination, then it's um, quite, a, quite useful to um, consider the adoption of uh, an anaerobic or microaerophilic monitoring regime. And uh, people who uh, listened to um, a recent webinar which um, I took part in with uh, Scott Sutton and Tony Cundell will uh, know that the Human Microbiome Project had indicated that there may well be uh, perhaps greater levels of anaerobic bacteria, particularly propioni bacterium, carried on the human skin than uh, perhaps has been conventionally considered. Okay, so moving on to the uh, monitoring methods. Uh, the USP does touch on uh, settle plates and generally uh, infers that settle plates should be used as indicative only and should not really, due to their limitations, be considered as quantitative measurements, which does draw up another contrast with EUGMP Annex 1. And uh, those familiar with Annex 1 will know that um, uh, it, it recommends semi-quantifying uh, the any counts recorded on the settle plate by expressing the number of colony forming units as the CFU recovered over a four hour period. So here we have a difference. There's also perhaps a difference from say um, some of the work carried out by Bill White which uh, is quite robust in the defense of settle plates and indicates that where um, the settle plates in the right location, then as an indicator of gravitational settling, it can be quite revealing about the potential risk to products and contamination. Um, so the USP is quite rightly, in my view, very cautious with environmental monitoring. And it states that no environmental monitoring program, no matter how robust and no matter how many samples there are, can or should attempt to prove sterility. It emphasizes that environmental control is more important than environmental monitoring. Really, the monitoring is checking that the physical aspects of control are as we expect them to be. Uh, it discusses the value of media field simulations, and that provides a, a valuable layer of confidence about the aseptic process and uh, emphasizes that environmental monitoring really is this sort of check of how well controls are going. Um, it also adds a further caution, and this is that environmental monitoring requirements have in many people's eyes, including regulators, but also the way microbiologists are perhaps sometimes interpreting the data, that they, these methods are involved in a way that does not really consider the analytical capability of the methods. So it really, it's warning that we're expecting more from the methods in terms of their ability to detect low-level contamination and the ability to differentiate between a few colony-forming units than the methods themselves are really capable of achieving. So in this sense, um, all environmental monitoring methods are flawed because they have a level of inaccuracy because they vary, uh, because people can easily contaminate them, and this becomes a big problem when assessing the ISO class 5 
or grade A environment, that no single method can capture everything, and in general, they're very poor at recovering damaged or stressed microorganisms. In fact, the very types of organisms that we would expect to find surviving within the harsh environment of the aseptic filling area. So for example, with active air samplers, uh, there are various different types of models on the market, such as those that work by impaction or centrifugal force or filtration. So there is variation between the models. Uh, some published studies indicate that they can vary in their efficiency by up to tenfold, and they have issues of accuracy, precision, and sensitivity. And similarly with surface methods, uh, generally these have poor recoveries. A contact plate maybe picks up 50% of what's on the surface, a swab moving down to the lower regions of 25, 20%. And then there are concerns with disinfectant neutralization and the problems in finding a universal disinfectant neutralizer. Um, so following on from this, the USP then says, well, if these methods are inaccurate and limited, then the very nature of the alert and action level concept needs to be called into question. And it's really saying that alert and action levels have evolved without sufficient consideration given to the inaccuracies in the methods uh, used to detect microbial numbers. So for example, treating a result of four colony forming units as anything significantly different from two colony forming units is not really scientifically justifiable. And this is because, and there's some very good works done by, uh, from papers from uh, uh, people like Sutton and Akers, um, saying that the limit of quantitation of the number of CFU that can be accurately reported is somewhere around the level of 15. So from this, the USP uh, is indicating that the word limits shouldn't really be used. That the, these are monitoring levels. They should not be considered to be specifications and should be seen as informational only. And instead, it's better practice to count non-zero events. So in other words, it's more important to show how often colony forming units are detected rather than worrying about the total number of colony forming units from any single event. And it goes on to discuss the use of the contamination recovery rate metric and one that's grounded on historical findings based on what is actually uh, linked to the performance of the clean room or aseptic filling line. And there's also an inference that once these contamination rate metrics are established, they should remain relatively stable over time with little variation. So let's just pause and consider these key points. Our environmental monitoring methods are inaccurate. So um, perhaps it's wrong simply just to enumerate the numbers of colony forming units. It may be better to count the incident rates and investigate out of trend situations. The limit of quantitation is uh, somewhere around the level of 15. Um, so, but it's also important to emphasize here we do have disagreement with EU GMP over this idea of numerical values. So one of the dangers is it could be assumed from too literal a reading of the USP chapter that it's that if a plate has a count of up to 14 in the aseptic manufacturing area, it's okay. And if it's 15 and above, it's a problem. And that would stand against EUGP, EUGMP Annex 1, inferring that a count of one is something that's reacted upon. And a number of MHRA and Irish Medicine Board inspectors that I've spoken to have expressed um, concerns about this. But I don't think the USP is saying ignore these high counts. It's more focused on the aspects of trending and long-term assessment. 
So the counter view is it doesn't really matter um, because if counts above one are rarely recorded, what really matters is how often this happens as this gives an indication of a decline in aseptic practice or bad operation or operators or a damaged HEPA filter. So what the USP is um, saying is that at very low recovery levels, there is no way to establish alert and action levels statistically, and the counts are simply too low to make statistical analysis useful. So instead, it's better to look at hits or incidents, and certainly at ISO class 5 or EEGMP grade A, these hits should be very infrequent indeed. So before um, looking at um, what the USP considers to be an acceptable level of incidence, or at least a starting point, what was the previous situation? So here I've drawn up a table, and this is looking at active air samples uh, for clean rooms in the operational state. And you can see that uh, with EUGMP Annex 1, the 2004 FDA guide, and with the previous version of the USP, the numerical values were essentially identical, albeit with the USP uh, being slightly higher. So that was the situation relatively harmonized. So what is the USP now recommending? Well, it's talking about, as I said, contamination rates, that is non-zero incidents, and it's saying that these rates should apply, should be different for different environments. So you can see that it's divided between isolators, a unidirectional airflow device in an ISO class 5 clean room, ISO 7, which is equivalent to the EUGMP grade B in operation, and ISO 8, which is equivalent to the EUGMP grade C. And you can see, so for example, with the isolator, we're expecting results over time of less than 0.1%, whereas for the uh, conventional filling machine within the clean room, it's rates of less than 1%. So you may be reading this, and it may throw up some questions, and, and two which spring to mind are, um, are these incident rates achievable? And another question is, should the level of risk really uh, not relate to the product and be irrespective of the environment? Because there's one danger here of saying, well, if I'm filling product X in an isolator, I must be achieving less than 0.1%. However, if I move product X to another facility down the road and filled it under a UDAF device in a conventional clean room, I'm allowed to have less than 1% but it could be the same product going for the same patient group. Is that right? So is it right to set contamination rates on the technology, or should it be based on the product? And that's an interesting uh, point to discuss at some point. Um, the USP then goes further with these contamination rates that were on the previous slide, and says that these should only be set initially. And after a period of time, the user should then set rates based on their own historical data. Once that historical baseline has been set, then the rates should be looked at on a monthly basis. And as part of this monthly review, when the rate goes above, that should trigger an investigation. And if that continues, then it would lead to things like the suspension of filling. So just as an example, I was playing around with some uh, data, and uh, I picked a, a grade B ISO class 7 clean room, and uh, I took some active air sampling data and looked at a period of one year, and uh, considered on this slide how the data might be presented and compiled on a monthly basis. 
and you can see uh, with the histogram and with the uh, frequency distribution chart how um, that the, this room, particular room, does not meet the recommended USP uh, because there are more than 5% non-zero events. In fact, we've got 81% um, of our samples are zero and 19% are non-zero. Is this a problem? If you analyze the data further, looking at the counts, if you were to take the EU GMP recommended action level, which these are air samplers, so that's 10 CFU per cubic meter, then only 0.6% of the samples exceeded that value. So from an EU GMP Annex 1 perspective, this set of data, it's a couple of samples over action, might trigger investigation, overall not too bad. From the USP perspective, it could infer an area that's out of control. Taking that data further and putting onto a, a shoe art chart, um, here you can see that there was a period, uh, a small pe concentrated period where the counts were out of limits and then a much wider set of data where the counts have been in limits. So um, it's not a continual rolling series of non-zero events distributed over time, but an actual concentration. So it's an interesting issue, and it just shows how you can take the USP approach and the EGMP approach, present data in different ways, look at it differently, and come up with um, different answers and different problems. Um, so moving on to other things within the USP chapter, the USP gives some advice for CAPA in relation to out of limits microbial events, uh, be that counts or incidents that require investigation. And it gives a useful list, and I've just picked a few things from that list, but it um, questions whether the sanitization program has been revised or needs revising, whether the selection of a disinfectant is correct, whether the frequencies of application of disinfectant are suitable. It considers uh, increased surveillance of personnel by supervisory staff, consideration of the microbiological sampling methods and techniques, and uh, also touches again on the uh, issue of training, which is always the recurrent one in most uh, discussions of, of CAPA. Uh, the USP also gives some useful uh, information and guidance about um, environmental monitoring frequencies of sampling. So first of all, it looks at um, isolators and recommends that um, active air sampling is done once a day, surface sampling is done at the end of each campaign, and glove sampling is a risk-based thing left to user's discretion. So this might appear as perhaps less rigorous than the EU GMP Annex 1's recommendation of continuous monitoring, particularly in the context of um, aseptic filling. Uh, next is the uh, RAB systems, the, the glove port devices. And the USP 1116 draws a distinction between the open RABs and the closed RABs and says that these are clearly different regarding their respective ability to manage contamination risks. So the open wraps, it recommends monitoring around the same level as the conventional clean room, that's the UDF device within the clean room, where there's a degree of direct operator intervention. But with the closed wraps, we're moving to something that's almost an isolator, and this should be um, at a higher frequency, and we should expect lower contamination rates due to there being less um, personnel activity. With the uh, standard clean rooms, this is actually unchanged from the previous version of USP 1116. And so for ISO class 5 areas and ISO class 7, that's our grade A and grade B clean rooms, 
It recommends uh, monitoring each operational shift. For the ISO class eight, which is our EU GMP grade C area, it recommends carrying out environmental monitoring twice per week. And then with other areas, which by inference is the EU GMP grade D area, because there's no direct equivalence for that area within the USP. It talks about uh, monitoring on a once a week frequency. With uh, sampling locations, uh, and I'm very pleased to see this in the USP, is that it does touch upon the use of a grid, such as found in the uh, particle counting standard, but it dismisses this and quite rightly says that sites of monitoring should be orientated to areas of high personnel activity using some form of risk assessment. And this is undertaken by careful observation, mapping the clean room, and noting the most likely routes of contamination, what people do, and where the biggest product contamination risk is. And to me, this is very sound advice. Um, other things in the USP chapter that are um, perhaps more minor but equally important, uh, there is a strong emphasis upon staff training, particularly those who take microbiological samples. And they need to go through some microbiological awareness. So if this is an activity which is delegated to production staff, then the quality department should make sure that these staff have a good level of training. Uh, it also states that there's a need for a qualified site microbiologist to be based on every site. So that may come as a relief to uh, some of you listening. There's also a uh, mention of staff health checks and uh, to have very strict control of entry into critical areas. Uh, an emphasis on the importance of correct gowning and of the use of risk assessment and uh, methods of risk mitigation. Um, the USP also mentions rapid microbiological methods for environmental monitoring and sees this as a significant future application. And here, uh, standing back and thinking about things, the um, current uh, technological wave of the spectrophotometric uh, particle counters that can distinguish between uh, viable and potentially viable microorganisms uh, do seem to offer a good advantage and are a very good fit with the incident rate approach. And um, for those who want to know more about that, then um, I'd recommend that you have a look at uh, Dr. Michael Miller's website, and there's some useful advice on there about this technology. Um, however, aside from that, uh, non tools rapid methods, all references to the validation of environmental monitoring methods have been uh, removed from the chapter, and whether they appear at a later date remains to be seen. Uh, there are some other sort of differences just worth highlighting in relation to uh, other regulatory guidances. Um, so we have with EU GMP, although we, you know, we have the limit of one, we also have the reference to these being average values. Uh, we have the FDA aseptic filling guidance 2004 saying that um, there should be a um, acknowledgement and their reaction to individual excursions. And then we have the USP uh, orientation towards incident rates. And around that, um, I think this is the area where I would very much like to see greater harmony between uh, different areas of regulatory guidance, because I think it can cause um, confusion in regulatory inspections and could mean more work for the microbiologist in the way that they present and interpret data. Um, it's also notable that both FDA guidance and EU GMP have a section about microbial resistance to sanitizers, and that isn't an area that's covered in the USP chapter. 
Um, however, the USP uh, does offer some advice on media field criteria, uh, which is actually slightly different and actually enhances upon what's an EU GMP Annex 1. So they're both worth um, drawing those texts together and analyzing those. In terms of um, future developments, it, it is notable that um, the USP may be considering a non-sterile's chapter. Uh, you can ignore the, the number that's referred onto the slide, that would not be the actual number, but a, a chapter around microbial control of non-sterile processing environments may be developed in tandem to USP 1116. And it would be useful here for such a chapter to define operational controls over non-sterile process areas and really offer some advice about things such as monitoring times and risk-based location selection. I think the difficulties here are that um, you know, the risks for um, non-steriles do vary perhaps much more widely than we find in aseptic processing there aren't very clear standards in relation to facility design and there are a lot of differences between um, different uh, manufacturers. So this uh, presentation is now um, drawing to a close. Um, just to uh, reiterate what the uh, main points from today have been. So what I've tried to do is to cover the uh, main points from the revised USP chapter, to take those key elements and offer, where appropriate, a comparison to EU GMP Annex 1, and to pick up areas that um, I would hesitate to use the word disagreement, but might cause some confusion between regulators from different agencies and in terms of data interpretation, and that really falls down to this issue of um, examining the data as incident rates as against examining data as individual counts and individual excursions. And it probably is possible to harmonize the two, although data presentation might need to vary a little bit. Um, so on balance, I say the USP 1116 is a useful chapter. I think that I speak for many people, it would be very good if we could move towards harmonization of uh, guidance in relation to sterile product and aseptic processing. Um, and it, the USP has made a step forward. ISO 14698, the biocontamination control standard is under revision and those who have access to national standards bodies can begin to influence that process and EU GNP Annex 1 is under revision and rumour has it that a new draft might be made available later um, this year. So I'm just going to close up and say that um, this webinar was brought to you by Pharmig, a pharmaceutical microbiology interest group, which is based in the UK and Ireland. And this webinar was um, provided um, free by Pharmig as a benefit to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, as stated on the slide, Pharmig offers a number of training courses and has a wide variety of publications. And if you look at the uh, website link on the slide, that will take you there and you'll be able to see publications relating to environmental monitoring, microbiology laboratories, non-sterile manufacturing, disinfectant, endotoxin testing, and so on. Uh, Farming intends to run some other webinars throughout the year and we'd be very interested to hear your thoughts and ideas as to suitable topics. So um, if you have any ideas or if you have any uh, comments uh, on today, then uh, please can you um, either email info at farming org.uk or if you're on LinkedIn 
if you go to either the farming LinkedIn group or to the pharmaceutical microbiology LinkedIn group, please post comments and questions on there. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And uh, I've enjoyed delivering this presentation and I hope it has been some use to the industry. So we are now signing off and on behalf of Farmig, we wish you a good afternoon. Goodbye.